The analytic synthetic distinction, also called the analytic synthetic dichotomy, is a semantic distinction used primarily in philosophy to distinguish propositions, in particular statements that are affirmative subject predicate judgments, into two types: analytic propositions and synthetic propositions. Analytic propositions are true by virtue of their meaning, while synthetic propositions are true by how their meaning relates to the world. However, philosophers have used the terms in very different ways. Furthermore, philosophers have debated whether there is a legitimate distinction. Kant Conceptual containment The philosopher Immanuel Kant uses the terms «analytic» and «synthetic» to divide propositions into two types. Kant introduces the analytic synthetic distinction in the introduction to his Critique of Pure Reason, 1781 A6 7, B10 There, he restricts his attention to statements that are affirmative subject predicate judgments and defines analytic proposition and synthetic proposition as follows. Analytic proposition, a proposition whose predicate concept is contained in its subject concept. Synthetic proposition, a proposition whose predicate concept is not contained in its subject concept but related examples of analytic propositions, on Kant's definition, include All bachelors are unmarried. All triangles have three sides. Kant's own example is All bodies are extended, that is, occupy space. A7, B11 Each of these statements is an affirmative subject predicate judgment, and, in each, the predicate concept is contained within the subject concept. The concept, bachelor, contains the concept, unmarried. The concept, unmarried, is part of the definition of the concept, bachelor. Likewise, for, triangle, and, has three sides, and so on. Examples of synthetic propositions, on Kant's definition, include All bachelors are alone All creatures with hearts have kidneys. Kant's own example is All bodies are heavy. That is, they experience a gravitational force. A7, B11 As with the previous examples classified as analytic propositions, each of these new statements is an affirmative subject predicate judgment. However, in none of these cases does the subject concept contain the predicate concept. The concept, bachelor, does not contain the concept, alone. Alone is not a part of the definition of bachelor. The same is true for creatures with hearts and have kidneys. Even if every creature with a heart also has kidneys, the concept, creature with a heart, does not contain the concept, has kidneys. Topic. Kant's version and the a priori, a posteriori distinction In the introduction to the Critique of Pure Reason, Kant contrasts his distinction between analytic and synthetic propositions with another distinction, the distinction between a priori and a posteriori propositions. He defines these terms as follows A priori proposition, a proposition whose justification does not rely upon experience. Moreover, the proposition can be validated by experience, but is not grounded in experience. Therefore, it is logically necessary a posteriori proposition, a proposition whose justification does rely upon experience. The proposition is validated by, and grounded in, experience. Therefore, it is logically contingent. Examples of a priori propositions include All bachelors are unmarried. 7 plus 5. Topic. 12. The justification of these propositions does not depend upon experience, one need not consult experience to determine whether all bachelors are unmarried, nor whether 7 plus 5. 12. Of course, as Kant would grant, experience is required to understand the concepts, bachelor, unmarried, 7, plus, and so forth. However, the a priori, a posteriori distinction as employed here by Kant refers not to the origins of the concepts but to the justification of the propositions. Once we have the concepts, experience is no longer necessary. 
Examples of a posteriori propositions include All bachelors are unhappy. Tables exist. Both of these propositions are a posteriori, any justification of them would require one's experience. The analytic, synthetic distinction and the a priori, a posteriori distinction together yield four types of propositions Analytic a priori Synthetic a priori Analytic a posteriori Synthetic a posteriori Kant posits the third type as obviously self-contradictory. Ruling it out, he discusses only the remaining three types as components of his epistemological framework—each, for brevity's sake, becoming, respectively, analytic, synthetic a priori, and empirical, or a posteriori, propositions. This triad will account for all propositions possible. The ease of knowing analytic propositions Part of Kant's argument in the introduction to the critique of pure reason involves arguing that there is no problem figuring out how knowledge of analytic propositions is possible. To know an analytic proposition, Kant argued, one need not consult experience. Instead, one needs merely to take the subject and extract from it, in accordance with the principle of contradiction, the required predicate. A7, B12. In analytic propositions, the predicate concept is contained in the subject concept. Thus, to know an analytic proposition is true, one need merely examine the concept of the subject. If one finds the predicate contained in the subject, the judgment is true. Thus, for example, one need not consult experience to determine whether all bachelors are unmarried is true. One need merely examine the subject concept bachelors and see if the predicate concept unmarried is contained in it and in fact it is unmarried is part of the definition of bachelor and so is contained within it thus the proposition all bachelors are unmarried can be known to be true without consulting experience it follows from this kant argued first all analytic propositions are a priori there are no a posteriori analytic propositions it follows, second, there is no problem understanding how we can know analytic propositions, we can know them because we only need to consult our concepts in order to determine that they are true. The possibility of metaphysics After ruling out the possibility of analytic a posteriori propositions, and explaining how we can obtain knowledge of analytic a priori propositions, Kant also explains how we can obtain knowledge of synthetic a posteriori propositions. That leaves only the question of how knowledge of synthetic a priori propositions is possible. This question is exceedingly important, Kant maintains, because all important metaphysical knowledge is of synthetic a priori propositions. If it is impossible to determine which synthetic a priori propositions are true, he argues, then metaphysics as a discipline is impossible. The remainder of the critique of pure reason is devoted to examining whether and how knowledge of synthetic a priori propositions is possible. <laughs> Logical positivists <laughs> Frege and Carnap revise the Kantian definition. Over a hundred years later, a group of philosophers took interest in Kant and his distinction between analytic and synthetic propositions, the logical positivists. Part of Kant's examination of the possibility of synthetic a priori knowledge involved the examination of mathematical propositions, such as 7 plus 5 equals 12 b 1516 The shortest distance between two points is a straight line B. 1617 Kant maintained that mathematical propositions such as these are synthetic a priori propositions, and that we know them. That they are synthetic, he thought, is obvious. The concept, equal to 12, is not contained within the concept, 7 plus 5, and the concept, straight line, is not contained within the concept, the shortest distance between two points. From this, Kant concluded that we have knowledge of synthetic a priori propositions. Gottlob Frege's notion of analyticity included a number of logical properties and relations beyond containment, symmetry, transitivity, antinomy, or negation and so on. He had a strong emphasis on formality, in particular formal definition, and also emphasized the idea of substitution of synonymous terms. 
all bachelors are unmarried can be expanded out with the formal definition of bachelor as unmarried man to form all unmarried men are unmarried which is recognizable as tautologous and therefore analytic from its logical form any statement of the form all x that are f and g are f Using this particular expanded idea of analyticity, Frege concluded that Kant's examples of arithmetical truths are analytical a priori truths and not synthetic a priori truths. Thanks to Frege's logical semantics, particularly his concept of analyticity, arithmetic truths like 7 plus 5 equals 12 are no longer synthetic a priori but analytical a priori truths in Carnap's extended sense of analytic. Hence logical empiricists are not subject to Kant's criticism of Hume for throwing out mathematics along with metaphysics. Here, logical empiricist is a synonym for logical positivist. Topic: The origin of the logical positivist's distinction. The logical positivists agreed with Kant that we have knowledge of mathematical truths, and further that mathematical propositions are a priori. However, they did not believe that any complex metaphysics, such as the type Kant supplied, are necessary to explain our knowledge of mathematical truths. Instead, the logical positivists maintained that our knowledge of judgments like, "...all bachelors are unmarried." And our knowledge of mathematics and logic are in the basic sense the same, all proceeded from our knowledge of the meanings of terms or the conventions of language. Since empiricism had always asserted that all knowledge is based on experience, this assertion had to include knowledge in mathematics. On the other hand, we believed that with respect to this problem the rationalists had been right in rejecting the old empiricist view that the truth of 2 plus 2 equals 4 is contingent on the observation of facts, a view that would lead to the unacceptable consequence that an arithmetical statement might possibly be refuted tomorrow by new experiences. Our solution, based upon Wittgenstein's conception, consisted in asserting the thesis of empiricism only for factual truth. By contrast, the truths of logic and mathematics are not in need of confirmation by observations, because they do not state anything about the world of facts, they hold for any possible combination of facts. Topic. Logical positivist definitions Thus the logical positivists drew a new distinction, and, inheriting the terms from Kant, named it the «analytic, synthetic distinction». They provided many different definitions, such as the following Analytic proposition, a proposition whose truth depends solely on the meaning of its terms Analytic proposition, a proposition that is true or false by definition Analytic proposition, a proposition that is made true or false solely by the conventions of language while the logical positivists believed that the only necessarily true propositions were analytic, they did not define «analytic proposition» as «necessarily true proposition» or «proposition that is true in all possible worlds». Synthetic propositions were then defined as Synthetic proposition, a proposition that is not analytic. These definitions applied to all propositions, regardless of whether they were of subject predicate form. Thus, under these definitions, the proposition, it is raining or it is not raining, was classified as analytic, while for Kant it was analytic by virtue of its logical form. And the proposition, 7 plus 5 equals 12, was classified as analytic, while under Kant's definitions it was synthetic. Two-dimensionalism Two-dimensionalism is an approach to semantics in analytic philosophy. It is a theory of how to determine the sense and reference of a word and the truth value of a sentence. It is intended to resolve a puzzle that has plagued philosophy for some time, namely, how is it possible to discover empirically that a necessary truth is true? Two-dimensionalism provides an analysis of the semantics of words and sentences that makes sense of this possibility. The theory was first developed by Robert Stalnaker, but it has been advocated by numerous philosophers since, including David Chalmers and Barrett Brogard. Any given sentence, for example, the words, "...water is H2O", 
is taken to express two distinct propositions, often referred to as a primary intention and a secondary intention, which together compose its meaning. The primary intention of a word or sentence is its sense, i.e., is the idea or method by which we find its referent. The primary intention of water might be a description, such as watery stuff. The thing picked out by the primary intention of water could have been otherwise. For example, on some other world where the inhabitants take water to mean watery stuff, but, where the chemical makeup of watery stuff is not H2O, it is not the case that water is H2O for that world. The secondary intention of water is whatever thing water happens to pick out in this world, whatever that world happens to be. So if we assign water the primary intention watery stuff then the secondary intention of water is H2O, since H2O is watery stuff in this world. The secondary intention of water in our world is H2O, which is H2O in every world because unlike watery stuff it is impossible for H2O to be other than H2O. When considered according to its secondary intention, water is H2O, is true in every world. If two-dimensionalism is workable it solves some very important problems in the philosophy of language. Saul Kripke has argued that, "...water is H2O", is an example of the necessary a posteriori, since we had to discover that water was H2O, but given that it is true, it cannot be false. It would be absurd to claim that something that is water is not H2O, for these are known to be identical. Quine's criticisms Rudolf Carnap was a strong proponent of the distinction between what he called internal questions, questions entertained within a framework, like a mathematical theory, and external questions, questions posed outside any framework, posed before the adoption of any framework. The internal questions could be of two types: logical or analytic, or logically true and factual, empirical, that is, matters of observation interpreted using terms from a framework. The external questions were also of two types, those that were confused pseudo-questions, one disguised in the form of a theoretical question, and those that could be reinterpreted as practical, pragmatic questions about whether a framework under consideration was more or less expedient, fruitful, conducive to the aim for which the language is intended. The adjective synthetic was not used by Carnap in his 1950 work Empiricism, Semantics, and Ontology. Carnap did define a «synthetic truth» in his work Meaning and Necessity, a sentence that is true, but not simply because «the semantical rules of the system suffice for establishing its truth». The notion of a synthetic truth is of something that is true both because of what it means and because of the way the world is, whereas analytic truths are true in virtue of meaning alone. Thus, what Carnap calls internal factual statements as opposed to internal logical statements could be taken as being also synthetic truths because they require observations, but some external statements also could be synthetic statements and Carnap would be doubtful about their status. The analytic synthetic argument therefore is not identical with the internal external distinction. In 1951, Willard van Orman Quine published the essay, Two Dogmas of Empiricism in which he argued that the analytic-synthetic distinction is untenable. The argument at bottom is that there are no «analytic» truths, but all truths involve an empirical aspect. In the first paragraph, Quine takes the distinction to be the following Analytic propositions, propositions grounded in meanings, independent of matters of fact. Synthetic propositions, propositions grounded in fact, Quine's position denying the analytic-synthetic distinction is summarized as follows. It is obvious that truth in general depends on both language and extralinguistic fact. Thus one is tempted to suppose in general that the truth of a statement is somehow analyzable into a linguistic component and a factual component. Given this supposition, it next seems reasonable that in some statements the factual component should be null, and these are the analytic statements. But, for all its a priori reasonableness, a boundary between analytic and synthetic statements simply has not been drawn. That there is such a distinction to be drawn at all is an unempirical dogma of empiricists, a metaphysical article of faith. 
To summarize Quine's argument, the notion of an analytic proposition requires a notion of synonymy, but establishing synonymy inevitably leads to matters of fact, synthetic propositions. Thus, there is no non-circular so no way to ground the notion of analytic propositions. While Quine's rejection of the analytic synthetic distinction is widely known, the precise argument for the rejection and its status is highly debated in contemporary philosophy. However, some for example, Boghossian, argue that Quine's rejection of the distinction is still widely accepted among philosophers, even if for poor reasons. Responses Paul Grice and P. F. Strassen criticized two dogmas", in their 1956 article, "...in defense of a dogma". Among other things, they argue that Quine's skepticism about synonyms leads to a skepticism about meaning. If statements can have meanings, then it would make sense to ask, "...what does it mean?" If it makes sense to ask, "...what does it mean?" then synonymy can be defined as follows, two sentences are synonymous if and only if the true answer of the question, "...what does it mean?" Asked of one of them is the true answer to the same question asked of the other. They also draw the conclusion that discussion about correct or incorrect translations would be impossible given Quine's argument. Four years after Grice and Strassen published their paper, Quine's book Word and Object was released. In the book Quine presented his theory of indeterminacy of translation. In Speech Acts, John Searle argues that from the difficulties encountered in trying to explicate analyticity by appeal to specific criteria, it does not follow that the notion itself is void. Considering the way which we would test any proposed list of criteria, which is by comparing their extension to the set of analytic statements, it would follow that any explication of what analyticity means presupposes that we already have at our disposal a working notion of analyticity. In Two Dogmas Revisited, Hilary Putnam argues that Quine is attacking two different notions. It seems to me there is as gross a distinction between all bachelors are unmarried and there is a book on this table as between any two things in this world, or at any rate, between any two linguistic expressions in the world. Analytic truth defined as a true statement derivable from a tautology by putting synonyms for synonyms as near Kant's account of analytic truth as a truth whose negation is a contradiction. Analytic truth defined as a truth confirmed no matter what, however, is closer to one of the traditional accounts of a priori. While the first four sections of Quine's paper concern analyticity, the last two concern a priority. Putnam considers the argument in the two last sections as independent of the first four, and at the same time as Putnam criticizes Quine, he also emphasizes his historical importance as the first top rank philosopher to both reject the notion of a priority and sketch a methodology without it. Gerald Katz, a one time associate of Noam Chomsky, countered the arguments of two dogmas directly by trying to define analyticity non-circularly on the syntactical features of sentences in philosophical analysis in the 20th century volume 1 the dawn of analysis scott Soames has pointed out that quine's circularity argument needs two of the logical positivist central theses to be effective all necessary and all a priori truths are analytic analyticity is needed to explain and legitimate necessity it is only when these two theses are accepted that quine's argument holds it is not a problem that the notion of necessity is presupposed by the notion of analyticity if necessity can be explained without analyticity. According to Soames, both theses were accepted by most philosophers when Quine published Two Dogmas. Today, however, Soames holds both statements to be antiquated. He says, "...very few philosophers today would accept either of these assertions, both of which now seem decidedly antique." Peikoff's criticisms Philosopher Leonard Peikoff, in his essay, "'The Analytic-Synthetic Dichotomy'", expands upon Ayn Rand's analysis. He posits that The theory of the analytic-synthetic dichotomy presents men with the following choice, if your statement is proved, it says nothing about that which exists, if it is about existence, it cannot be proved. If it is demonstrated by logical argument, it represents a subjective convention, if it asserts a fact, logic cannot establish it. If you validate it by an appeal to the meanings of your concepts, then it is cut off from reality, if you validate it by an appeal to your percepts, then you cannot be certain of it. To Peikoff, the critical question is, what is included in the meaning of a concept? 
He rejects the idea that some of the characteristics of a concept's reference are excluded from the concept. Applying Rand's theory that a concept is a mental integration of similar existence, treated as units, he argues that concepts stand for and mean the actual existence, including all their characteristics, not just those used to pick out the reference or define the concept. He states, Since a concept is an integration of units, it has no content or meaning apart from its units. The meaning of a concept consists of the units—the existence, which it integrates, including all the characteristics of these units. The fact that certain characteristics are, at a given time, unknown to man, does not indicate that these characteristics are excluded from the entity, or from the concept. Furthermore, he argues that there is no valid distinction between necessary and contingent facts, and that all truths are learned and validated by the same process, the application of logic to perceptual data. Associated with the analytic synthetic dichotomy are a cluster of other divisions that objectivism also regards as false and artificial, such as logical truth versus factual truth, logically possible versus empirically possible, and a priori versus the a posteriori. Topic see also Holofrastic indeterminacy Paul Boghossian topic Footnotes topic References and further reading Beer, Jason S. October 18, 2006. J. Fieser, B. Dowden, E. D. S. A priori and a posteriori. The Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Boghossian, Paul, 1996. Analyticity Reconsidered. Noose, Vol. 30, No. 3, pp. 360–391. Corey Jull, Eric Loomis Analyticity. Routledge. ISBN 978-0415773331. Glock, Hans Johann, Gluer, Catherine, Kyle, Geert. 2003. Fifty Years of Quines. Two Dogmas. Rodopi. ISBN 978-9042009486. Kant, Emanuel. 1781–1998. The Critique of Pure Reason. Trans. By P. Geyer and A. W. Wood, Cambridge University Press. Ray, Georges. 2003. The Analytic, Synthetic Distinction. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, Edward Zalta, ed. Soames, Scott, 2009. Chapter 14: Ontology, Analyticity, and Meaning: The quine carnap Dispute, PDF. In David John Chalmers, David Manley, Ryan Wasserman. Metametaphysics: New Essays on the Foundations of Ontology. Oxford University Press. ISBN 978-0199546046. Frank X. Ryan 2004. Analytic, Analytic, Synthetic. In John Lax, Robert B. Talies. American Philosophy, An Encyclopedia. Psychology Press. pp. 36–39. ISBN 978-0203492796. Quine, W. V. Two Dogmas of Empiricism. Philosophical Review, Vol. 60, No. 1, pp. 20–43. Reprinted in From a Logical Point of View Cambridge, MA, Harvard University Press, 1953. Robert Hanna 2012. The Return of the Analytic Synthetic Distinction PDF. Paradigmy. Topic External links Analytic Synthetic Distinction at Philpapers Zalta, Edward N. Ed. The Analytic, Synthetic Distinction. Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Analytic Synthetic Distinction at the Indiana Philosophy Ontology Project Analytic Synthetic Distinction. Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Willard Van Orman Quine, The Analytic, Synthetic Distinction. Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy.